the example of Jesus is ours. Let us respond with obedience. The wind of the Spirit is blowing. Let us respond with joy. Praise be to God. Please join me in page 395. Read on. Thank you. 
to a real life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all loneliness and meekness, with patience, for very one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. It is yet for that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipment of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, the mature manhood, in the measure of the stature and fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carry about with every wind of doctrine by the plenty of men, with their craftiness and deceitful wiles, rather speaking in truth, in love, we are to grow up in every way into him, who is the head into Christ, from whom is the whole body, joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied. When each part is working properly, makes bodily growth, this is the word of God. Thanks for the God. <laughs> now it's time for time with the children, and please join in with Jesus loves me. Yeah, they should have cleanliness. Nice. They should be nice, because they have to interact with students every day too. 
Should they maybe like be detail oriented? Pay attention to details to make sure that like the floors get clean and the desk gets clean so there's no germs, so you don't want to get sick as often, right? Okay, so we got janitors, principals, teachers, students, what else? Cafeteria ladies. <laughs> 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 no? Okay, so what kind of characteristics should cafeteria lady possess? Or cafeteria man? What should they possess? The ability to prove evil questions. The ability to prove evil questions. I don't think that that happens to be What? What else? Should they be good cooks? Maybe? Yeah. As much as they can? In a school setting? Government restrictions? Yeah. Yes. Um, what else? So you'd be like able to talk to them and you guys have like chat with the lunch ladies? No. No. Um, like, <laughs> you should. You should like watch your day. What's up? How are you doing? Lunch ladies have to lose you. They would always tell me I need more money. Okay, I'm going to ask this again. So you want to show you all these different people and all these different people you need to have a school that runs, right? Like, can you imagine if the lunch ladies just decided they weren't going to show up one day? You'd probably be like hangry all day and don't learn anything because you'd be more concerned about what you were going to eat than what your teacher was teaching you, right? And if the principal decided that uh, they were just done and they just stopped showing up, there'd probably be a little bit of chaos, right? So, like, in high school, sometimes if the principal's not going to be there, he leaves the light on so the kids don't know that he's not there because they know the kids will be worse if the principal isn't there, right? <laughs> Um, teachers, the teachers just stop showing up. You have like a sub every day. But would you learn as much? Probably not. So my point is, is that it takes all kinds of people to make a school run, right? All these different people with different characteristics. Like, I would not want to be a principal because I don't want to deal with this at all. That's fine. In the same way, and what we talk about in the scripture today is that God gives each of you gifts. So each of you has something that you're really, really, really good at, right? It's like, Jane, what are you really, really good at? Uh, track. Track. Okay, so you're going to You're also a very enthusiastic singer, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, what are you really good at? You're really good at math. So you're going to math. You're also a really enthusiastic singer, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Okay, what are you really good at? Singing enthusiastically, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Kennedy, what are you really good at? Stuff. Stuff. Good stuff. Okay, so everybody is in America is really, really, really good. And what God wants us to do is use those things that we're really, really, really good at to help develop our world and to help others and to be a good person and to help our church to grow. This is what mom would always tell me when I did it, when I sing when I was younger, enthusiastically. <laughs> and she would say, you have this thing that God's given you, and so you need to use that. And so then I had to do it, because you can't argue with, with that. So, what I would ask each of you is to think about those things that you're really, really, really good at. Because you all have something. And to use that thing that you're really, really good at to help make the world a better place. Kind of like teachers maybe use their listening to make the world a better place. Or janitors may use their attention to detail to make the school and then the world a better place. Or lunch ladies might use their math cooking skills to make kids happy and to write something to say. Okay? Alright, so let's say a prayer. Dear God, help us to use our talents to make our world a better place. And to show everybody your love. Amen. For some reason, it seemed to call them aren't really excited about talking about school yet. Um, I don't know why it is. I, I've got I got good news for you guys though. It's still summer. School hasn't started yet. School has not started yet. It's still summer. So what I want to talk about today is summer school. Have you ever been? To, have you guys ever, ever been to summer, summer school? Have you ever been to summer school? Have you ever gone to summer school? No. Have you ever gone? No. I did. You went to summer school? You went to summer school? No. <laughs> You're just a nerdy school person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Summer school. Well, I, I've got to admit, I, I, yeah, my boss and your sister and brother and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got to admit, I as a kid, I never went to summer school either. I, I never went to summer school. How many of you ever went to summer school? Yeah, there's some of you that went to summer school. I, I never, as a kid, when I was growing up, I didn't really think much about summer school. I thought that summer was time when you're not supposed to go to school. When you get to sleep later, you don't have to get up early every morning. You have to go sit in the classroom. But uh, then I became a teacher myself. And I found out there was such a thing as summer school. And as a teacher, like most students, I tried to avoid summer school <laughs> as much as I possibly could. But there came those years where I was trying to survive on a teacher's salary. My wife was also a teacher, but only a part-time teacher. <laughs> and so for some extra income, I would go and I would teach summer school because they always needed teachers at summer school. Um, and so I, I did become involved in some summer school programs and did some teaching in summer school, even though I was never a student in summer school. And the, the summer schools that I am uh, familiar with, that, that I was involved with as a teacher, they really were uh, offering um, coursework and offering um, classes that uh, were not your AP classes. They weren't the advanced classes. We didn't have AP um, a European history in summer school. We had very basic history class. We had English was like English 101, the most basic English you could have, or, or basic science and basic math. There were some PE classes you could get PE or, or art or music. They offered some of those, but those were required classes that you could still take in summer school. Basically, the summer schools that I were associated with were, were those classes that were being offered that where kids needed a little extra help. They weren't really getting a lot of new material. They were just reviewing and going through things that they'd already been exposed to, but they might still need a little extra help in some of those areas to maybe be promoted to the next grade. Or maybe they needed some extra credit in some of those areas so they could be on track to graduate from high school if they were in high school. And I taught in high school summer schools. Uh, they weren't really being exposed to a lot of new information. Instead, they were be being presented with information that they had heard before, that they should have already known, but they were getting a review of it. They were getting a little more intensive look at it. They were being reminded of what it is that they needed really to know to be caught up, to be ready for the school to begin in fall. As I read this passage from Ephesians, and really the whole middle section of Ephesians, it reminded me of summer school. Because what Paul is doing in this section of Ephesians He's not giving the church at Ephesus any new information. He's not telling them anything they don't already know, that they haven't already heard many times. But what he's doing is giving them almost a summer school lesson, a refresher course, if you will, on what it means to be a Christian church and what it means to be Christians in the world. And he was reminding them of who they were and what they should be. He wasn't telling them anything new. Uh, he was telling them things that they had heard from, some of them from Jesus themselves, and some of them from the other apostles' teachings and things that they had known for a long time. But he still was giving them this refresher course. So as I read through this and thought about what some of the things he was talking about in Ephesians were that Paul was talking about, I was thinking, this reminds me of my summer school experience teaching. So I thought for this morning, we'll just have a little refresher course on what it means to be the church and what Paul is telling us it means to be a Christian. Um, I actually thought about doing like a three or four week uh, series on these, but I didn't really want it to turn into summer school. So, so we'll only have this morning that you'll have to listen to me put back on my teacher hat and follow in the footsteps of Paul and try to give us just a little refresher on what he's saying about what it means to be a part of the Christian church. And you're not going to, I don't think any of you are going to hear anything new this morning. 
I don't think anything that, that, that I'm going to say and I'm going to refer to that Paul is talking about, it's not going to be new material to you. But I think all of us can benefit from hearing this and being reminded of who we are, or at least who we are supposed to be as a church and as Christians in this world today. Shall we pray? Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I really enjoyed the book of Ephesians. It's not a very long book. It doesn't appear in the lectionary uh, very often at all. Um, so even though there are several stories about Jesus from John in the lectionary at this time of year, um, we get those opportunities to look at those and think about those at a lot of different times throughout the three-year lectionary cycle. Not very often do we look, get to look at Ephesians. So you may have noticed that a lot this summer I've been trying to focus on Ephesians. And as we get into this middle section of the book of Ephesians, um, it really is, to me, Paul giving a refresher course to the, re to the church at Ephesus about what it means to be the church and to be Christians in the world. So this basic course, this refresher, this, this summer school curriculum that Paul has given to the people at, Eph at, at Ephesus, he begins by reminding Christians of how we are to get along with our brothers and sisters in this world. And so that's where I'll begin uh, this morning in my points. Of course, Becky has three points that we want to try to deal with today. Becky always says, well, there's, you know, let's have three points. Well, yeah, like, you're right. I do have this time. Uh, so that, but it's a refresher course. They're, they're, they're not new things to you. The things you know and that you've heard before, but I think they're very three very important things that Paul emphasizes here uh, in Ephesians 4 about being Christians. And what he's talking about first is Christian unity. Several years ago, the Bill Gaither Trio, I know I'm probably dating myself by referring to the Bill Gaither Trio. I'm sure some of you have heard the Bill Gaither Trio and some of their gospel music and some of their work. And it's, you know. Well, several years ago, they recorded the song with this title. This was the title. How are we going to spend eternity in heaven with those people we can't stand on earth? <laughs> that was the title of one of their gospel numbers. Uh, you get it. How are we going to spend eternity in heaven with those people we can't stand on earth? And you know, you laugh, but you, you get the point, right? You get the point. You know, Christians don't always get along, do we? Christians don't always get along, you know. Uh, Sometimes Catholics are, are at odds with the Lutherans. Baptists almost always struggle with Presbyterians for some reason. Episcopals <laughs> fight with everybody, basically, I think, Episcopalians. And, and that's just between the denominations. Believe it or not, some congregations have factions within that congregation that fight with each other. And they divide over what seem to be petty and often insignificant issues in their church. Well, Paul says right here in the beginning of Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, it shouldn't be this way. Christians are the body of Christ. That's what the church is called to be. That's what the church is all about. You know, that, that we are joined and knit together by the very ligaments of Jesus. So Paul begins this review of what it means to be a Christian and to be in the church with these words. He said in Ephesians 4 1, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, and it is believed that when Paul wrote this letter to Ephesus, he was actually in jail. He was actually a prisoner. So he refers to that many times in, in some of his letters. He says, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling for which you have been called. We have all been called as Christians. And he says, I beg you to lead the life worthy of the calling in which you've been called with, now listen to this, I think it's a key point, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. 
making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. What is Paul saying? He's saying that, that when Jesus called us to be his body, his church, that we're supposed to treat each other with, with dignity, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. You know, all, all those people over there in the Catholic Church, all, all of those people, they are our brothers and sisters. Did you know that? All, all those Catholics that are here in St. Genevieve are our brothers and sisters. And they're not so bad. My, even, even one of them gave me some black hairs this week. So, you know. uh, the members of the Hope Church are members of our family. If someone transfers their membership from here to Grace Baptist Church, they aren't going over to the dark side. <laughs> They're just changing the church address. Did you know that there really, truly is only one Christian church in St. Timothy? As a matter of fact, there's only one Christian church in the entire country. There's only one Christian church in the entire world. And we are all a part of it. And yet sometimes the way we behave, not just in this congregation, but in many congregations, the way we behave suggests that we have really the answers. And the other denominations, eh, they're not exactly right. They don't have it exactly correct. It's, you know, I, I remember Billy Graham once saying that uh, each denomination thinks that they hold on to this direct line to heaven and won't we all be surprised when we get to heaven to discover that we only held just one single strand from a giant rope. We're all members of this body of Christ. We are one church, united as a Christian fellowship. Now that's, that's not to say that we all agree. We know that that's not the fact. We disagree a lot. We disagree even with each other sitting here in this room with members of our own congregation. We certainly disagree with, with other churches, other denominations as well. There are differences of opinion on things political. There are differences of opinion on things ideological. There are differences of opinion on things theological. There are differences of opinion on issues regarding lifestyles. But the fact of the matter is, as Christians, there is a lot more that unites us than can ever divide us. There's a lot more that unites us that can ever divide us. We are sinners. Jesus died for us. We are all children of God who have been promised eternal life. We are commissioned to share not only God's good news, but to serve the disenfranchised of this world. Those are the things we have in common with all other Christians, all other members of the body of Christ. Those are the qualities that set us apart as the church. Unfortunately, we let all sorts of things divide us, you know. So what are some of those? Well, the, you know, the age and time that we're baptized, that sort of divides some churches. Uh, the style of our worship services, that causes division within our churches. Even the fact that we serve grape juice instead of wine, you know, that divides some denominations and, and separates us. And we argue over that at, at, at different times. Um, <laughs> There are many things that we allow to get in our way recently, whether or not gay marriage should be allowed in church. And I believe, I really believe, and I think Paul believed this as well, that it breaks God's heart to watch us bicker and divide over things as inconsequential as those. 
And here I am. You think you think I haven't been at odds with other Christians or criticized other churches? Sure, sure I have. Of course I have. Uh, that's why I'm hearing Paul's summer school lesson as well. Just as you're hearing it as we're going through it. And this is why Paul begins by saying, with humility and gentleness and patience, make every effort to maintain unity and peace. You know, if only we did this in this congregation, we'd be a model for churches everywhere. The second thing, the second point that Paul teaches us in today's text is that we each have a different function in Christ's body, as we heard this morning, Nicole talked about here. Some are pastors, some are teachers, some are vacation Bible school workers, some are choir members, some are lawn mowing people. The lawn looks great out there today. I don't know if you guys can say that, huh? Uh, some are craft making children, some are kitchen working grandmas, but all are necessary. All are necessary. You know how boring it would be if everyone in this church were a pastor? Uh, you know, we couldn't stand it. One is probably more than, than we need some days. Uh, or if the only gift we had in this church was actually enthusiastic singing. So that's the only gift we had. Now, now we saw that from some of our youth this morning. We're going to see it again here shortly. Uh, but what, if, if, if that was the only gift we have, well, who type the bulletins? How do we get that taken care of uh, for our church? You know, if every member of this church had the gift of teaching, and I know there are a lot of teachers and, and former teachers here in this church, so several of you do have the gift of teaching, but if every member had the gift of teaching, who would be the students? Uh, yeah. Uh, very gifts. Everyone valuable. Everyone essential. That's how God created the church to be. And I think the conflict comes when we start believing that our gift, that what we do, is somehow more important than what someone else does. No, it's not. We need them all. We need every single person in the body of Christ for that body to function. Sometimes the conflict comes when we wish we'd been given a different gift. Maybe we're jealous of someone else's gifts. You know how that goes. You know, I once learned, and to be honest, I once learned this by playing the game Trivial Pursuit. You know, I've learned a lot of things playing a game. If you've never played it, it sort of, in my heyday, we went to parties and played that game a lot. I learned a lot of trivial things, perhaps, from that. But, but one thing, I'm going to use it here in this message this morning. One thing I learned uh, from that game is that the most important body part, when it comes to our balance while standing up, anybody know what it is? The big toe. The big toe. Cut off your big toes, and you wouldn't be able to walk in a straight line. Who knew the big toe could be so important? You couldn't balance. You couldn't do all, you, you barely stand up without the big toe. Yet, you know, if we were to list the parts of the body that are desirable and necessary and significant, I bet the big toe would be way down <laughs> on the bottom of that list. You are an important part of the body of Christ. Whatever skill you possess, Whatever gift you bring to the table, you are necessary. And sometimes when churches lose their balance and begin to wobble and even fall over, I think it's because members are withholding their contribution of time or talent or treasure. But you are the big toe. You're the big toe. You didn't even know it, but you're the big toe for this church. We can't be healthy. We can't be a healthy, unified body without you doing your part. Paul says this is basic to our being the church. Okay. So, you knew that. You may not have known you were the big toe, but, but you knew that. You knew that, that everybody's necessary. The final lesson on this summer school Sunday morning is perhaps the most important of all. Paul says, speak 
the truth with love. Speak the truth with love. You know, I, I think that sentiment is becoming a dying art in our contemporary culture. And maybe it even was all the way back 2,000 years ago in the Church of Ephesus because Paul emphasized this to them. He told them, and he tells us, speak the truth in love. Today, we either, we either speak the truth coldly and harshly, or we sort of fudge a little bit, maybe tell a little white lie that's not really truthful. When it comes to, to speaking to people regarding their performance or their behavior, we are either very hard on them, or we're a little dishonest about what we really think. A couple of examples from way back in my day, once again. Herb Brooks. Herb Brooks was preparing the U.S. Olympic hockey team for Lake Placid for the 1980 Olympics. He was the coach of that particular hockey team, which, you know what happened. It was a miraculous that these young uh, American guys defeated these Russians in the, in the gold medal uh, match, and, and the U.S. won the gold medal in the U.S. Olympic hockey. Um, he was preparing the hockey team as they were practicing, and he got so frustrated with their progress that he announced to the press, he announced to the press that these guys are playing worse every day, and right now they're playing like it's next week. <laughs> you think about that. They're playing worse every day, and now they're playing like it's, they're, they're really playing really poorly. I mean, he, he gave that, that's what it, that was the quote that went to the reporters, that went out over all the headlines, this is how the U.S. hockey team is doing. That's, you know, that's not the type of encouragement that makes people feel all warm and fuzzy inside. I mean, think those hockey players smile out lately, read that, oh, we're, we're, we're really bad. On the other hand, when the city of New Orleans was riding away in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, you remember that? Uh, very sad uh, situation in our country's history. Well, just a couple of months into that situation, President Bush announced on national television his appraisal of FEMA director Mike Brown. And his quote was, Brownie, he's doing a heck of a job. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. People in New Orleans were ignored and were dying. But the president did what so many of us often do. He soft peddled the truth. So it's not to hurt feelings, perhaps, but it wasn't telling the truth. Well, in the church, in the church, we're supposed to know that. That's what Paul says here. Speaking the truth in love means that we are honest about what a person has done or said because we care about them. Because they are important to us. And we know they are important to God. So we speak the truth in love. We're not trying to tear anybody down. That's not what Paul's saying. We're trying to build them up. We want to build each other up. But sometimes you have to speak the truth in love to do that. We're not trying to hurt anybody. We're trying to help everyone. Because everyone's essential to this body of Christ. And if that's not our motive to build them up or to help them, if that's not our motive when we confront someone, then Paul says don't confront them because you won't be speaking the truth in love. You have to speak the truth with love as a Christian body. You know, I've been privileged so far in my lifetime, in my ministry, as I've ministered throughout my years, to have people around me who have spoken the truth in love to me. So when I've done well, they've been generous with their praise, but when I could have done better, they were honest and direct with me. But it really wasn't criticism, it was the truth spoken in love. And fortunately for me, my wife Julia is the best that I've ever met at being able to do this. She's honest and at the same time gracious and kind, but she's honest with me. 
Now, she could have listened to this message this morning, and she might have told me this is the worst message that she's ever heard in her entire life. I didn't share it with her, so she didn't get the opportunity to, to tell me that. Because she could have told me that, and I would have felt like thanking her for, for her words, for telling her. That's, that's just how she can, she can phrase things. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. That's the sort of truth speaking that can make a church a safe and growing place. A church should be a safe and growing place. But it should be an honest place. We should be able to speak the truth with each other. But we've got to do it with love. Well, class is almost over this morning. Summer, summer school, this session is, is about done. So, so uh, I, I've got a so, so good teacher. What do I have to do here at the end? Yeah, very, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the three points, the three points I had. You remember what they are, right? The first point Paul was talking about was Christian unity. Basically, Christian unity. We are one church. And we are called to treat our brothers and sisters in Christ with humility and gentleness and patience. Bearing one another in love. Making every effort to maintain the unity of spirit. Because there is one body. There is one Christian church. The second point that I made from, from what Paul said here is that we all have different functions. We all have different functions in the body of Christ. Whatever skill you possess, whatever gift you bring to the church, you are necessary. Remember, if you don't remember anything else, I bet you'll remember this, you are the big toe. You are the big toe. And finally, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Truth speaking makes the church not only a safe place, but it makes it a growing place so that we can continue to grow. We can continue to become closer and more connected to God as individuals and as a community of faith. We care about each other. We care about our brothers and sisters. So we must speak the truth in love. To them. You've been very attentive students today. And just so you know, maybe I should have told you this earlier, there will be a test. <laughs> but I don't make that test. You can probably guess who does. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us now respond to this word by rising either in body or in spirit, and singing together our hymn of response, number 591, have the one on the table, show it up. Thank you. <laughs>
In your bulletin this morning, you find the Apostles' Creed, one of the greatest affirmations of faith ever devised by the body of Christ, by the Christian church. So together with believers all around this city, all around this state, all around this world, and all around this community, let's join in this world, let us join our voices together in this affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand
we do not fear because we know you are here with us. We ask now that these tokens be blessed to allow others in this world to also not have to fear with the realization that you are there for them as well. Bless these now for use in establishing your kingdom around this world. Amen. You may be seated. Let us now join our hearts and minds in a moment of silence as we prepare ourselves for prayer.
we are joined at Hashi. And we will meet again. And next Sunday we will meet at 8 a.m. after you've enjoyed that beautiful sunrise for a very short service. So I hope to see you then. Also, there is, isn't it a live fellowship meal today? At, right after the service that you're invited to be a part of. Um, by design, I will not be there for that meal as you'll be discussing plans to hopefully call uh, a, a handsome uh, <laughs> uh, at some point. Uh, so I won't be there for the meal. Uh, so I'll say my goodbyes to you as you leave your day. I will not be going downstairs. So we'll let someone down there say grace for the meal when you get down there. Uh, since I, I, I don't want to bless it because I'm not going to be here. As this week goes on, as you prepare yourself perhaps for the big weekend next weekend here at Fed, I hope you uh, enjoy those festivities and can be a part of those as well. Um, but regardless of what you're doing this week, whether you're going camping and going on vacation, you heard you decided not to go on vacation, or whatever it is that uh, you, you may be doing this week, wherever you find yourself, remember that you are a part of the body of Christ. You are a member of this universal church. And wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, you remember that God is there with you. God is right there above you. God is below you. God is behind you. God goes before you. God stands right beside you. And most importantly of all, God is inside you as well. Go in peace, my friends. Amen. <laughs>